Okay, uh, good evening and good morning to our audience uh, in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, actually, our speakers are joining from uh, Manila and Hanoi, so good morning there. I'm Giyuk Shin, uh, Director of the Schoenstein Asia Pacific uh, Research Center here at Stanford. Uh, thank you for joining us online uh, for today's uh, discussion. Uh, this quarter, our center has a webinar series, uh, Asian Perspectives on the US-China uh, Competition. Uh, needless to say, uh, competition has become the dominant uh, strategic paradigm in defining U.S.-China relations, a uh, really comprehensive area from security military areas to trade, uh, infrastructure, technology, uh, aid, and even uh, human resource. So how is the increasing rivalry uh, between the two great powers influencing Asia? How do Asian nations perceive the efforts by Washington and Beijing to define uh, competing visions uh, for the region. So our webinar series this quarter explores you know, these and other questions uh, you know, coming from uh, the great power competition uh, across uh, Asia. So today we are going to feature our Southeast Asia program and I'm really happy to introduce uh, its director, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Don Emerson. So once again, welcome and please enjoy uh, today's session, uh, Dan. Thank you, Giwok, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and welcome to all of you who have uh, signed up and hopefully are uh, participating at least as attendees in this webinar. Southeast Asia in the new Cold War, choosing not to choose, question mark, right? I emphasize the question mark. I do wanna note that if you are not already on our email list and would like to receive notice of our future events, you can do so by visiting our website, Southeast Asia Program, Stanford. The French have a saying, uh, they have lots of sayings. One of their sayings is, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. In the 20th century, the United States and the Soviet Union waged the first Cold War. Is this really the second? Is history really repeating itself today? If this webinar were convened and staffed by historians, they would probably say, no, the differences between conditions then and now are simply too great. What is happening now is not Cold War 2.0, it's something else. But whether you agree or not with the phrase new Cold War in the subtitle of this webinar, the global situation that we face today, so tragically illustrated by Russia's war in Ukraine, whatever you call that situation, is fragile, dangerous, and urgently worthy of attention. Our two speakers today are amply qualified to provide that attention. To save time, I will introduce them very, very briefly. Richard Haydarian is a senior lecturer in the Asian Center at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and a prolific columnist. In addition to his notable academic career in various universities, he has published extensively on platforms such as Foreign Affairs, <clears throat> The Guardian, The New York Times. His many books include a recent one of particular relevance to our discussion today subtitled, The New Struggle for Global Mastery. Hong Le Tu is Principal Policy Fellow in the Perth USA Center at the University of Western Australia and a non-resident fellow in CSIS Washington's Southeast Asia program. She has a PhD from National Cheng Chi University, has published widely in four different languages and has held positions in universities and think tanks in Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and in the ASEAN Secretariat, among other places. Our plan is for Richard and Hong to convey their interpretations of the situation as it affects Southeast Asia, as it is looked at from Southeast Asia and acted upon perhaps to some extent at least by Southeast Asians, followed by some conversation among the three of us, leaving time for Q&A uh, at the end. <clears throat> 
Uh, hopefully we have up to half an hour, depending upon how many questions there are. Do please channel those questions through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Richard, it's your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Don, and folks at St uh, Stanford University for this invitation. Always a pleasure. Let me just, I don't do this caveat, but I barely got some sleep. So congratulations to our friends in the United States for uh, for making it to the next round in what you call soccer, but actually it's football <laughs> and denying another Asian country a spot uh, in the elimination round. No bitterness about that, but let me quickly go to my uh, obligation this morning or this evening for you folks. Now in Southeast Asia, of course, the common uh, strategic cliche is we don't want to make a choice between the United States and China. But for me, not making a choice is a choice in itself. And over time, not making a choice is going to be a luxury for more and more countries in the region. Whether we can pull it off successfully or not, I'm not increasingly sure about that as a situation. The great power competition, to put it in a PC way rather than calling a new, new Cold War, uh, intensifies. Uh, so much so that now there are even conversations about the new non-aligned movement, which I, I'm sure we'll discuss more with Hong uh, and Don uh, later on. Well, as far as the response of Southeast Asia is concerned, I would say it's a 50 shades of balancing, right? Uh, it's not only diversity of balancing and hedging strategy, or we can call it multi-vector strategy, but also you can see a shift in balancing strategy of different administration within the same country. And I'll shortly uh, discuss the Philippine case. Um, but before that, let me just say that this year, I found this year very interesting for Southeast Asia because I know Don has been very strong on this. Uh, and I'm gonna, and it's Indonesia, right? I mean, for a very long time, Indonesia has been more or less like the biggest invisible nation on earth, right? And as Don pointed out in the 1980s, right? In the foreign affairs piece that I, I always love to quote, there's a big gap between the strategic relevance of Indonesia and the amount of attention it gets, you know, especially when you compare it to some of the smaller Southeast Asian countries, which tend to get a lot of attention and it almost the PR public relations oxygen in the room. So I'm very glad that this year, finally, Indonesia is getting the kind of recognition or at least something close to that. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I, just before our talk here, I was in Jakarta for a series of conversation. And I could see in the glittering eyes of my audience and my diplomatic counterparts and friends in Indonesia, how much they were looking for this moment, right? Obviously, we're not there yet completely. But clearly, Indonesia loves the idea of projecting itself as a middle power. You know? and, uh, and the G20 is something they made the most out of it. So from Bali to Jakarta, I saw, I saw G20 more than any other word. Right? Everywhere I go, G20, G20, G20. And you could really see how Jokowi was preparing for it. And they saw this as their moment and that their kind of Olympics international uh, debut moment. And to be honest, uh, Don, my worry is that if the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which has been a pillar of Indonesia's foreign policy for quite some time with different degrees of commitment, if the ASEAN doesn't get its act together, you'll have more and more countries like Indonesia, but down the road, perhaps even Vietnam or Philippines who are emerging middle powers, essentially saying, you know, we're too big for ASEAN and operating more and more on their own, right? So, which brings me to the issue of ASEAN centrality, because the reality is that when it comes to the Indo-Pacific and to the great power competition in the Indo-Pacific, the idea of ASEAN centrality is clearly more aspirational than a geopolitical reality. But the one big contribution that I think ASEAN has made is the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. To be honest, I did not appreciate it until recently. I saw that as a kind of a pretentious, trying hard, trying to push yourself into the conversation, let's just call it geopolitical Karen, right? But upon further reflection, I realized actually the AOIP makes it one big contribution, which is to change the tone and cadence of the whole Indo-Pacific discourse. Because remember before the AOIP came in, I remember Don, you were kind enough, but I was having a hard time getting people to review my Indo-Pacific book in ASEAN. Because the moment they saw the title, it's like, oh, this is Trump thing. This is a Shinzo Abe thing. This is a Modi thing. We don't want to touch that. But once the AOIP was coming out, suddenly, suddenly ASEAN is, including a Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN, who did a review of my book, was comfortable with it. Because what AOIP did was to give it a different tone, a register, which was much more inclusive, much more cooperative, and less new Cold War-ish, right? Now, whether we're successful or not, 
that's besides the point because it's still a game that is going on, right? It's still a moving target, but at least ASEAN was able to inject that. So I think that was a first strong move. And that's why I told our Indonesian friends next year when they're gonna take over the ASEAN chairmanship, I hope they'll continue this process and we go from semantics, battle of semantics, which we tend to do okay, to much more proactiveness on the geopolitical front. Now, I wanna end on this point because I, I'm sure we're, we, I mean, end on my opening line, of course, because I'm sure Hong and everyone has so much good to say. Going back to the issue of 50 shades of balancing, right? Now, this is absolutely clear in the case of my country, the Philippines, whereby you see what the wild swing, not only between reformist and authoritarian or authoritarian leaning presidents, but wild swing among similarly minded presidents, at least on the surface. So on the surface, the Dutertes and Marcoses are essentially cut from the same marble, right? Or the same imeldific shoes, whatever, textile, whatever you want to put it there. Um, but when it comes to foreign policy, right, there's a significant shift we're seeing from Marcos vis-a-vis -vis Duterte. I mean, in Hegelian terms, it's a negation of negation, right? It is a negation of the reformist presidencies of Aquino's foreign policy, which was very US centric, focus on human rights and democracy promotion. So Marcos is not going back to that, but clearly it's also a recalibration of Duterte's subservient policy towards China and extremely hostile relations towards the West. Over the past five, six months, Marcos Jr. has met in flesh twice already by then. He has met Kamala Harris in Manila. He has met Anthony Blinken in Manila, which is way more than what Duterte did in his entire six years, right? where he never visited the US. But it's not just meetings. It's not just personal diplomacy. It's what's happening on the ground. And this brings me back to the opening line that I made on making a choice or not making choice. On the surface, the Philippines is just like any other ASEAN country. We always say we're neutral on regional conflicts. We don't want to make a choice. But in a way, uh, John and Hong and our friends who are joining us, the Philippines is already making the choice as we speak. So the reason why Kamal Harris was in the Philippines above everything else is because there are ongoing negotiations right now for America to gain access to a number of strategic bases, not only close to the South China Sea, which is so 2014, right? I'm talking about the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and the five bases that were supposed to be open on that, two bases very particularly focused on the South China Sea, the Bautista Air Base in Palawan, and the one in Pampanga, the Basa Air Base. But now, we're not only talking about those ones, because under Duterte, we were dragging our foot because of the China charm offensive strategy of Duterte. But now we're looking at opening up potentially even bases in the north, in the Batanes area, in the Cagayan area. We have a base in Mavulis, which is just over 100 nautical miles from the southern shores of Taiwan. And all the war games that we saw earlier this year in CSIS and CNA said that if there's going to be a kinetic action by China against Taiwan, the southern shores will be one big focus for China. So as early as now, the U.S. is preparing for that scenario, is trying to deter that scenario. Of course, the Ukraine parallel is very clear because our European friends, our Baltic friends are saying we have to beat the Russians well here so that the Chinese think twice about Taiwan. But the Taiwanese and those in the region are going to also tell you that maybe we have to deter China by also preparations here. And one of the preparations is precisely looping in the Philippines into this deterrent strategy. Now, as I said, Marcos would want to be as neutral and nice to everyone as possible. But operational preparations and hedging, uh, operation and alignment is already happening as we speak. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing more of that later on because I'm sure it's a big topic in itself. Because now, Don, we're not only talking about Southeast Asia, we're talking about the broader East Asian region mm -hmm. because Taiwan is very much tied to the U.S.-Philippine alliance. And of course, U.S.-Philippine alliance is very much part of the bigger picture of U.S.-China competition in Southeast Asia. So this distinction between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia is increasingly really withering away because of this Taiwan element and the Philippine element. We're closer to Taiwan than practically all our Southeast Asian neighbors, right? Just to put things into context, right? Geography wise, right? Tyranny of geography and our geography from the tyranny of China. Okay, I'll keep it there before we get more controversial. Okay, I hope I was coherent enough for my two yeah. hours. I'll get back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very rich. You covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. I'm tempted to comment, but I won't uh, comment now. I will later. Uh, really well done. Very well done. I appreciate that. Hung, it's your turn. Thank you, Don, and it's great to be with you and, and Stanford Project again. Good to be um, with the audience. I see some familiar faces to hi to everyone. Uh, just an, an, oh, sorry, an opening um, 
remark uh, in regard to the very framing and title of the webinar. So I think it's it's very problematic to, to cast the current state as new Cold War in many ways. And there, there is a robust debate on that. My um, short view on this is that it's not necessarily helpful to cast it that way because, um, you know, there are different definitions and how you see um, that comparison. Whether it, you know, uh, it is it, it is something that um, I think everybody falls into because it's the, the closest to what um, we've experienced in collective memory. But I'm sure the historians will come up with a new name. I think if you if you de define Cold War as a dynamic that is you know based on the standoff, nuclear standoff and ideological struggle between US and the Soviet we, uh, Union, that, then it's not really uh, the, uh, you know, adequate for this, time, for this time around of a great power competition. But if you uh, expand that to the state of hostility short of armed conflict, which we see a lot of element of that, then maybe it is in, in a way uh, resembling that. But my only... Um, advise if anyone from uh, the US government or policy making circle is listening is that never fight the last war, because if you fight the last war, you're bound to be losing because everything has changed, including your adversaries and environment around that. Um, the analogy is might be useful for discussion, but uh, the dimensions have changed, right? It, it was much more um, a, much more easier to contain back then. Now the dimensions are much more complex, intertwined, and there are more of them. So if we use that analogy, um, I, I don't think it puts us in in a um, you know ad, advantageous position. Um, but uh, not going into too much of that historical context, I would just also emphasize that it's not very comfortable comparison for the region either, especially um, Southeast Asia where, you know, most of countries at that point where post-colonial had really uh, been struggling for their independence and became in many ways uh, speaking especially from where I'm speaking today, it was not a cold war, it was a hot, hot war, it was a proxy war, it was something that I had to live through, but I don't think it would be anything that they want to um, replicate today. So I think they've learned lessons from the cold war, um, and certainly that pushback about not taking sides, not being forced to choose sides. Um, I think that's the lesson learned, right? Nobody wants to be a pawn um, in that, that containment or the domino um, theory again. Nobody wants to be um, an arena of uh, proxy war again. So like Richard, uh, I, am, I see through that narrative of not choosing uh, a little bit further than just at face value. But I would offer just for our discussion another perspective is that yes, not not refusing to, to uh, choose is a choice in itself, I agree. But it's not always, so in some cases it is, and Richard is right to point to that, um, that you know, you're giving away your agency. But uh, in other cases is actually could be seen as positive, right? Uh, it's not necessarily negative and not necessarily passive because uh, not choosing is also um, a way to expand their options. And while countries don't want to, to choose, they do want to have a lot of options. And then that doesn't um, really exclude to only US or China, they want, other options in sm smaller major powers, including Japan, Australia, Korea, European Union, they want our players, not just the G2. Um, and not choosing an uh, option is also giving them more flexibility, right? Like I said, they've learned their lessons. Um, like again, Vietnam uh, was, a case of that in the Cold War, you know, choosing, you know, sticking to, to the choices that not always, even, we, even within the same camp where Vietnam sided with Soviet Union when um, the Sino-Soviet split became really ugly and bad the consequences then too, right? So not choosing very, you know, rigidly is also giving them more flexibility. As you hear from the leaders of Southeast Asia, or they want to be friends with everyone, right? They want to be, uh, trade with everyone. They want to have diplomatic relations with everyone. And that's why they succeeded in hosting those 
three recent summits of ASEAN's APEC and G20 because they guarded that neutrality and they guarded that ability to be speaking and being friends with everyone. So it's actually, um, you know, a, 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 the uh, agency as well is not just giving away an agency. It is um, something that empowers them. Um, I think another point on, on choices uh, I would make is that, you know, choices are not terminal, uh, like, you know, not, not in, in, in the Cold War era we, where you, you know, it's almost like binded about life sentences. In many ways, they are flexible, more flexible than they used to be. Um, in fact, if you look at, uh, you know, even from the historical context, it's not about sticking it is about whether they stick to the choices that they had made or not. And the cases being particularly Thailand and Philippines who are treaty allies with the US, but they're not necessarily very much, uh, you know, in alignment in every aspect with the United States, especially Thailand these days, right? With the Philippines, as uh, Richard point out, it is still in flux depending on the le leadership, but they are now have, each of those countries have much more complex web and network of relationships beyond the just alliances. So whether they're sticking to um, the, every commitment that they had um, and they had made, you know, 50 some years ago or 70 some years ago with a treaty alliance, um, it is other, another choice. So in, in that way, great power competition gi are giving the Southeast Asian more options uh, and more choices, right? Um, and I, I'll uh, perhaps be, be wrapping up uh, with saying that I think the mood is changing, right? It's not just um, uh, the, the question of choice. I think how countries, US and China are competing and how that competition uh, is evolving is also so shaping re the response. A couple of years ago when, um, well, a few years ago, when, when Trump came up with that Indo-Pacific strategy and talking about, you know, really um, uh, open uh, competition with, with uh, China, I wrote a piece called, you know, Southeast Asia Hope for the Neutrality Preparing for Choice. And, and that was based on Prime Minister Li Xinlong's speech. But as you see now, I think there is growing frustration and pushback uh, also from Singapore about not, um, you know, pushing great powers not to uh, force Southeast Asia to choose too much because they do benefit from a more conducive, um, especially in economic environment where they can trade and do businesses with everyone. Now, I think I would, the last point I would end uh, my opening remarks on is that Rather than using maybe Cold War analogy, it would be more interesting to look at, um, you know, polarity of the of the new order. Whether we are actually heading towards a bipolarity or multipolarity, I think bipolarity, the way we know it from the Cold War, is not really happening uh, to the degree because neither of the poles, uh, US or China, why undoubtedly the most powerful, uh, neither of them are completely attractive or they will remain as strong as they used to be. I think personally, they have, both countries have uh, big internal issues, um, which will factor in their future, uh, likely weakening them. And um, is this a question mark whether the intensity of competition as we see it today will sustain in five or 10 or even 20 years. Uh, in the Cold War era, the gap, the power gap and the disparity between the major poles and Southeast Asia in particular was huge. I think that gap is, is narrowing and is going to further narrow. So the re relative power gap is going to likely um, further narrow down the line in the future. And therefore, you know, there isn't that much um, of uh, disparity or asymmetry between the major powers and Southeast Asians. And I think Southeast Asian increasingly as they grow uh, economically pow more powerful and as of now, post-COVID era, they are being seen as growing epicenter of economic growth. I think they will um, likely to also have more agency and more say uh, in the global politics. Um, but as, as we speak today, I think multipolarity is still very um, 
uh, uh, very, we are hoping for multi multipolar polarity. It's aspirational because, in a way, it is fragmented world, but we don't have like a third group, as, as some would argue, it, that are all um, non aligned. It's not consolidated, it's not by no way unified, it's a very mixed back. Um, it's a very fragmented world that we are seeing now. It, it, it includes, that description includes Southeast Asia and South Asia as well, let alone the rest of the world. But it is very interesting to see how so-called the rest of the world uh, further develop and uh, respond to the great power competition. I'll stop here and uh, uh, look forward for the discussion. Well, thank you very much. Lots of insights uh, from both of you. Really appreciated. In the, in the time we have remaining before we open it up for questions from the audience, let me just, um, this is gonna take a little time, uh, begin a process of interaction between the three of us. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I could go back uh, just in the order in which you spoke uh, and feel free to comment on, uh, on my comments with regard to what Richard said. So this is a threesome, it's not a, it's not a twosome. Um, the AIOP, uh, your interpretation is extremely interesting because, of course, the IOP did not originate in Southeast Asia. And although I think both of us, you and I, agree that the content uh, of the outlook, of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, I mean, when I read it, I thought to myself, what's happening here is ASEAN is saying to the world, we matter, we matter. This is important, right? Because it's all about ASEAN. It's actually in a way more about ASEAN in terms of the references than it is about to this incredibly broad and diverse area that we choose to call the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think it's, it's, your interpretation is, is, is absolutely fascinating uh, insofar as the Indo-Pacific then was in some sense sort of not exactly co-opted, but at least on paper uh, taken into account in the context not of the Indo-Pacific, but of Asia, uh, uh, and particularly of Southeast Asia and the role of ASEAN. And I think that was, uh, that's, that's an interesting interpretation and I, I, I share your view. Both of you commented with regard to the Cold War and I am the guilty person who is responsible for the subtitle of this webinar. <laughs> and I think I chose a new Cold War because I knew it would attract attention, uh, that Clearly. frankly, to be perfectly honest, uh, even though I'm a scholar, so I'm I'm not an advertiser supposedly, but you know it was uh, it was PR basically. I wanted to you know attract people's attention, uh, and I think yes, the historical uh, analogy uh, is really uh, it, it's it's a difficult one to make. But then the question is, uh, well, what is happening? And here I'm I'm fascinated by your comments. I mean, Hung. Uh, Toward, toward the end of your remarks, you were very, very optimistic, which uh, I find really encouraging, especially as a Southeast Asianist, insofar as you were really almost saying to yourself and to the rest of us that Southeast Asia could become in its own right, uh, not just an individual country like Indonesia, but the region perhaps as a whole could become a dynamic location with an identity of its own. Uh, and so that the, the notion that these great powers Namely, in this case, I suppose you would say, well, actually, there are three of them. That's another reason why the Cold War uh, analogy doesn't work, because, of course, Russia is part of this three-way three, three -way complication, if you will, tension, competition, uh, including violent uh, events uh, on the ground in, in Ukraine. Um, and that in that context, Southeast Asia could benefit economically as 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 businesses, this is already beginning to happen, especially given what's happened with the zero COVID, COVID policy in China, which is pushing some investors to other parts of the world, and in particular, yes, to Southeast Asia. That, in other words, what I'm saying, I guess, is you're almost you're almost telling us that Southeast Asians could end up choosing themselves, choosing Southeast Asia. And this flips the whole interpretation away from this notion of choice into a different realm that, that we also talk about quite a bit, but is perhaps more suitable, which is strategic autonomy. Right. Strategic autonomy, right? Uh, one might even say, uh, Richard, that your comments, uh, including what's happening in, in the islands to the north, you know, the your remarkable and very creative assertion that the difference between Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia is becoming uh, harder and harder to detect 
uh, given the circumstances that you know the spillover effects from uh, from uh, the South China Sea, um, that you know uh, in, in increasingly the countries of Southeast Asia uh, will not be playing the negative role of non-choice because after all, uh, one of the problems I think with operationalizing the notion of a new non-alignment is the non, the non is negative. You say you're not aligned. Actually, what I hear from Richard in particular is that what is happening is multi-alignment, constant, different kinds, different extenses, you know, a gesture here, a gesture there. Um, we, we talk about mini-lateralism. Mini-lateralism in a way is an example of partial uh, alignments, uh, of limited alignments. And that, that if that continues, it's going to wipe out the bipolarity entirely uh, and replace it with something else, including the possibility that Southeast Asia as a regional actor could become more and more important. But here I want to go back to Richard, especially since he's been in Indonesia with regard to the G20. India takes over the G20. India, you can't talk about non-alignment yeah. without talking about India. You know, uh, <laughs> they are historically wedded. So I guess the question I have is when India chairs the G20 uh, next year, uh, is it conceivable that the interpretation of the G20's role will increasingly be that of an alternative, a focus, yes, in which the big powers can come and sit around the table and not fight and so forth, but in which the leadership of the middle range, if, you, if we include India as it's a very big country, but still of the middle range, that that will mark the kind of debut of a kind of origin of influence that we had previously overlooked in our concentration on the bipolarity, especially of the 20th century uh, in that particular Cold War. And that not only are we opening up a world of massive multilateralism, Right. But actually, minilateralism, perhaps even more importantly, uh, is going to enable new emerging locations, including Southeast Asia, that will become increasingly influential. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I guess, depends on what kinds of policies those intermediate uh, actors uh, would undertake. But that at least is, uh, I think, an interesting possibility. I don't know if either one of you want to comment on those remarks. Yeah, don't, can I go uh, quickly on this? Because weirdly, exactly what you said is that here on my notes. I can send you a screenshot. I, I have the words strategic autonomy there, Indian case, right? So <laughs> thank you for essentially continuing my neural paths, right? This is getting creepy. It always happens when we're in the same panel. I mean, first of all, I'm going to talk about the uh, the India case before I'm going, ba uh, going back to the very absolutely... Uh, uh, you know, sensible critique that Hong made of also the the you know the opposite of making choices when you should not at some point, right? So which, which is perfect, and I think we definitely have to build on that argument. First of all, an India one. I mean, the first major intervention conference I attended was Munich Security Conference earlier this year, right? And the panel I was uh, asking a question at was the Jai Shankar Quad panel of the four mm -hmm. uh, ministers' representatives, and mm -hmm. as early as then. I sense a different India, totally a different India, right? Because I remember asking Jai Shankar back in 2017 in, in Delhi, uh, in one of the, uh, the Raisina dialogue about the whole China, US China competition. And he gave me this extremely, let's say, um, diplomatic uh, answer. You know? The tone was very different this year when I asked him, in particular, I asked him, what do you have to say about people who say Quad is like, uh, NATO with Asian characteristics or something like that, right? And he immediately went after it. And as someone who's active on social media, I, I look at him and said, okay, an influencer has been born, right? And if you look, at, if you go online right now, I'm losing count. I mean, I think it's a close fight between Jordan Peterson and Jai Shankar on YouTube on like Jai Shankar destroyed, you know, this Western critic, Jai Shankar. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is the wolf warrior diplomacy of India born, right? Or I'd rather call it RRR. If you watch the Netflix movie of India, kind of anti-colonial, which is also a cool one, I suggest you guys watch, watch. Something very interesting is happening with India because we saw India in the, I mean, this was, I don't know, 
honestly, I, for me, as from an ethical standpoint, what is what I see they're doing with Russia is naked opportunism, right? Uh, welcoming on Mars dirt cheap Russian exports and Russians giving them everything, right? I just saw a, a new graph coming out of everything that Russians are offering, including parts of automobiles. You know what I'm saying? So, and of course, the Indians are couching all of this in strategic autonomy and non-alignment, right? How brilliant, right? It's like, so, I mean, we see it for what it is, but at the same time, I mean, I understand where India coming from. You know, you got a lot of people, you know, to take care of. So, but, but the way they're using the Neruvian language, right to justify this clear opportunism when it comes to juicing out the Russians because the Russians are desperate because of sanctions and really tiptoeing around the Ukraine issue, which I found really bizarre because it's clear violation of the sovereignty of a small country, something that Nero would have been shocked by mm -hmm. as far as the response of his successors are concerned, right? So I find this very interesting before saying more controversial things because I have, you know, I don't want to have more trolls in the other side of the Pacific soon, uh, but we're going to get into that. So, but the thing is this, uh, Don, India is getting away with it, right? I mean, there's a lot of push for Pentagon to give them the green light to get the Russian S-400 without getting uh, the CATSA sanctions, right? Uh, we effectively saw the U.S. Treasury Secretary saying, okay, you can go ahead with buying your Russian oil without the fear of Western sanctions. I mean, uh, this, is, this is the understanding I have. And if you're sitting in Southeast Asia, you're in Indonesia, you're in Vietnam, right? By the way, Vietnam also, I, I've been talking to our Vietnamese friends, like, how are you managing this? Because Russia is also an extremely important partner to you, even more so perhaps than to India. Uh, you know, if you're looking at this and you say, well, wait, India is getting away with it. So why are you pressuring us not to buy? It? You get what I'm saying? This is, this is very important. So I'm watching the Indian situation because it has direct implication for, let's call it, fence sitters or friends of Russia in this region to continue what they're doing. So much so that even Marcos Jr. in the Philippines, is what everything I mentioned, he wants to still do G2G deals with Russia on agricultural fertilizer front because of the food security. In you get what I'm saying? So what India doing is, is having a ripple effect. So perfect. I really love how, Don, you pointed that out because that was also at the back of my head. So, so for me, I think we're going to see a codification of this new phenomenon, which is kind of cow strategic opportunism in the language of non-alignment and kind of getting, getting away with it. I think this is what India is doing, right? As I said, I'm saying this from a position of love and understanding for India. And I always believe India can do better because I, I look up to India as a kind of an alternative to, to China mm -hmm. as a moral force, but of course, things are different. Now, on the, the, on the issue of uh, strategic autonomy and also the, the very uh, trenchant critique that Hong raised, yeah, I mean, in the same way that we should not make a broad, generalistic cliche that we should not make choices, uh, to say also that we have to make choices, it's a, also a cliche that doesn't make sense, right? So that's why your approach to use, sorry, the feminist language is intersectional. There are going to be issues whereby it's going to be much easier for us to take a much more active strategic ambivalence, right, uh, and hedging. But there are going to be other issues where, whereby it's going to be increasingly difficult for us not to do that. We can debate about this issue, but my sense is like South China Sea could be one of those issues whereby active ambivalence is not helping anyone because it's fueling hegemonic desire of a certain party at the expense of everyone else, right? But I'm sure there are other areas whereby, uh, let's say, for instance, the, sanction, the semiconductor tech wars between China and the U.S., maybe we can create an alternative global South solidarity, right? From Singapore to Saudi Arabia, all the way to Chile, right? Something, or Switzerland, right? So I definitely agree, but I say maybe it's a case-to-case -case basis. So on certain areas, we need calibrated intervention. We cannot just say we don't want to do anything. In certain areas, we need principled neutrality. And this is where I praise Indonesia because I think earlier this year, there was an impression that Jokowi is going the Modi way. On, on the Russia question, mm -hmm. but we really saw in the G20, he rallied it, whereby it became very clear that there is a consensus, minus Lavrov, I don't know where Lavrov was at some point, um, that nuclear weapons should not be used. Even Xi Jinping was on board. That was big. That was big. And also that what happened in Ukraine is not right. So if you look at the G20 statement, which was essentially copy-pasted by APEC statement, right? I think the, 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 the red lines were clear in ways that was not clear earlier this year. So I call that principled neutrality. I think the G20 statement on the Ukraine issue is much closer to what I believe is principle. So I'm not against neutrality, but I'm against opportunistic neutrality being couched in the language of I'm for principled neutrality. 
as much as I also understand why Vietnam had to be had to at least. I mean, I'm good. I'm glad actually with Vietnam at least abstaining right on this issue because if Vietnam voted for Russia, then it would be make it a little bit more difficult for for us right outside who want to you know say you know give Vietnam. And the last point, I, I um, yeah, okay, no, actually that's fine. My my point is I also agree with Hong that. Yeah, it's it's hard to say it's a bipolar situation, and you're also right, Don. It was never it was tripolar actually in the Indochina wars and others, and it's true. I mean, if you look at the ICS surveys, where I'm sure Hong, I, and a lot of us have been respondents for quite some time, right? Yeah, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies. So, um, you can clearly see Japan and EU tend to do much better than U.S. and China, right? Mm -hmm. As on many fronts, especially Japan, consistently on the top, right? which absolutely confirms what Hong has been saying. We have discomfort with both U.S. and, 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 and China, especially the Trumpian version of U.S., which is not going to go away. We might see a version of that soon. We can have Trumpism without Trump also, which we, we keep in mind. So that is why we are desperate for alternatives. And that's why India is important. But so is Japan, so is Australia, so is Europe. I always tell my European friends, our European friends, do not... Um, underestimate your contributions to a free and open in the Pacific. Because I see a lot of European friends saying, what's the point of you sending naval warships there? It's a joke, right? It's not make, gonna make a difference, right? And you're not gonna go inside the 12 nautical miles of the Chinese fake islands. But for me, that's not the point. The point is by Europeans being there, by Japanese and others being there in different ways, not necessarily the American phonops way, you're making it clear that what's happening in the South China Sea is a matter of international law and international rule of law, rather than a US-China intramural. The more we have non-US countries involved in this part of the world, the easier it is for us to push back against China's claim that this is all about hegemonic warfare, because it's not. It's us ASEAN trying to protect the interests of smaller countries by upholding international law, because there's a strong correlation between international law and the interests of smaller countries in ways that doesn't apply to either US and China. Because let's be honest, US is also an exceptional power, exceptional in the sense that it takes exception also to international law when it serves its purpose. And we see hypocrisy through and through, right? So, so Southeast Asia is not blind also to Western hypocrisy. By the way, just to end on that note before I get back for what I said on India and China. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, before I hand it over to Hong, I, I do want to make one hopefully very brief comment, and that is the notion of principled neutrality. The adjective is is critical. Um, as, as I'm sure both of you know, there is an inclination, I think particularly of Kishore Mahbubani, right? Kishore Mahbubani is a proponent uh, of pragmatism. He's very much in favor of pragmatism which of course is the alternative, right, to principles, because principles tend to constrain behavior, whereas pragmatism, well, actually, as you were almost implying, can actually turn out to be opportunism, right? You take advantage. For example, the tension between the United States and China presents an opportunity to some in Southeast Asia pragmatically to take advantage of that and so forth. And I, at some point, if we had time, perhaps during the Q&A or maybe even before then, the normative dimension, I think, would be worth uh, keeping in mind. Uh, that is to say, does democracy matter at all in this context? Uh, we talk about intermestic relations, the, the intensely interconnected uh, nature of domestic politics and foreign policy. You know, we, they're really hard to separate. There's a dynamic that goes back and forth. And, and is, it, is it really fair to assume moral equivalence between China and the United States on the part of countries in what we used to call the third world, right, including in Southeast Asia? Uh, I mean, that's a question. I, you know, I'm not answering that. I'm just posing that to, 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 to wonder whether pragmatism, however attractive it may be in the short run, may turn out not to be a productive approach in the longer run when one has to deal with fundamental questions that yes, go all the way back. I mean, to the question of the sovereignty of a particular state, uh, of the sanctity of its borders, uh, in which case to, to draw a moral equivalence between you know, the United States and Russia, good Lord, uh, is completely beside the point. Or maybe that normative argument doesn't really get us very far. I'm not sure. Hung, what, what are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Don. I'll 
I'll start with the question you posed earlier about um, uh, you know, how strategic autonomy and Southeast Asian choosing themselves, is, is that okay? Uh, I think I've said it many times that I'll repeat it again, is that uh, when it comes to, for example, Vietnam, in the US-China competition, Vietnam will always choose Vietnam. And I think it's it's a case for uh, a number of countries, I think, if, if not majority of countries. Richard mentioned how well um, uh, Indonesia did as a chair um, president of a G G20. And, and in fact, um, President Jokowi attributed that neutrality and non-alignment uh, to the success of this year's G20. But at the same time, you know, Indonesia was working very hard. Jokowi was working very hard to also benefit the country during this presidency. For example, it pocketed like 20 something billion dollars of uh, the energy deal uh, for itself. And a lot of that international um, appearance being mediating between Russia and Ukraine, including, was really driven from by domestic politics. So it's always very much, you know, thinking of the own interest um, and economic resilience first. That includes the um, infrastructure uh, deals and infrastructure projects that Indonesia is pumping up really is about investing in own country, in own capacity and resilience, right? Um, even in the case of smaller countries like Cambodia, Hunsen is very shrewd. He, you know, we, in the West, it tend to be looking at Cambodia and Laos, perhaps it's more true in the case of Laos, as very um, dependent and not having agency. They are trying to invest in their own economic growth, development, and resilience. So it's, it is um, choosing themselves, Don, in, in that way. Um, of course, not all will be in that position. Some will face more dependency, and the region will not be uh, unifiably more strong economically. Some of them will fall into bigger dependencies. Of course, it's not just one big decision. It is every decision or small. It's like everyday choices, right? That can can lead to dependency, yeah. whether it's conscious or not. But uh, how I would um, summarize the, the current situation, very complex situation in Southeast Asia in a very pragmatic way. Um, I love those kind of conceptual discussion, but if you talk to policymakers, they don't care if we, you call it, you know, new Cold War or Cold War rules-based order, whatever. They don't care what you call them. What they are interested in is um, for the regional, for the bigger picture, uh, regional or global order to have some stability and level of predictability that helps them maneuver and operate. For themselves, what they want is strategic autonomy. Again, very, very hot um, term that everybody exploring right now. And how to achieve, you know, again, that ha can have different definition, but how to achieve that strategic autonomy, I think first and foremost is through prosperity according to the Southeast Asians. So it's a first, maybe it's insufficient condi condition, but it is a necessary condition uh, first and foremost. Um, so I'll, I'll just give that summary of um, my recent um, conversations to you now. Uh, I think um, in principle, <laughs> I agree with both of you. I've written a, a couple of bases for Nikkei, one calling for uh, ASEAN to have a more principled approach, uh, another calling, you know, model through neutrality is bad for ASEAN. So the same, the same starting point, which is, you know, ASEAN, of course, is no one ASEAN foreign policy, but every individual countries, but as a cohort, um, that I think, in the particular case of, of Ukraine that um, both of you quoted, agnostic about countries and um, neutrality that is based uh, on principles in inter international law uh, should be uh, the goal. It's not necessarily how it came out to be, but um, yeah, I think that maneuvering or uh, interpreting interpreting uh, neutrality in different ways uh, actually can hurt um, ASEAN and, and their agency. Now, if we speak about ASEAN, well, let's see, let's face it, it there are mountain challenges uh, within ASEAN that prevents this organization or this group to be as we want it to be, as Richard said, you know, aspirationally unified cohort, right? Um, and, and we know the internal issues, Richard mentioned some of them, but there's, you know, there's elephant in a room being the Myanmar, which is not a full member right now anymore, which will compromise 
the integrity um, and strategic uh, uh, operation uh, of um, ASEAN. And if we look uh, at the, you know, when things come up will be if Timor successfully will be actually admitted to ASEAN, whether it will further strengthen or further weaken um, ASEAN. I think there are valid uh, arguments uh, on both sides, but uh, I think it is uh, fair to say that um, ASEAN's utility is very different than it used to be uh, in the Cold, uh, or post Cold War um, era. And uh, even though we want it to be that neutralizing platform, the, the platform of neutrality, it is being compromised uh, in many ways. Uh, so I think the utility for individual in uh, ASEAN member states is uh, has also changed because of that. Now, we don't know whether um, countries will be able to re revive or revitalize ASEAN for maximizing their diplomatic agency through the, this platform. Um, I don't know if there is going to be a new idea for a, a replacement of ASEAN. So far, we're stuck with ASEAN as it is, with all its flaws, um, and you know that will linger through for a number of years. Uh, but um, there isn't that much of, of alternative, um, even though the recent summits have proven some, you know, use of of ASEAN's diplomacy, being able to bring all the um, major powers, whether they are in agreement or disagreement or even um, uh, conflict or competition together. Um, that's probably it that ASEAN can do for its members, rather than really expanding it, uh, their uh, strategic autonomy. Um, yeah, I might stop here to be able to get some questions of audience from audience too. Good, that's uh, coming right up. Let me start with a question from Hunter Marston, <clears throat> and I'm going to read it. For Hong, I would push back a bit on the power disparity between Southeast Asian nations and the great powers. Doesn't Vietnam have to maintain good ties with China precisely because it doesn't have adequate defenses to truly balance against China? For Richard. Is Manila's security better served by the quote unquote independent foreign policy, both Bong Bong and Duterte espoused by bolstering its own defenses to narrow the power gap or by continuing to rely on its ally, the US? From Hunter Marston of Australian National University. So there's a question for each one of you. All right, okay. Yeah, you can always count on um, Hunter chiming in. Uh, not, the gap will always be there, uh, but if you compare, which I did with the Cold War era, there is a, a significant change between the gap then between you, Vietnam and China and now. Um, economically, you can use all kinds of indicators. Of course, China is much more powerful now in terms of economic indicators compared to the China then, but Vietnam as well. Um, and uh, you know, if you compare the uh, diplomatic capacity back then and now, Vietnam is in much better position now. Um, it has much more, uh, you know, developed network of friendship beyond that uh, Eastern Bloc era, uh, limitations. Now it has friends with everyone in the world. Um, quite one very successful. It has the biggest and highest rate of, of trade deals. Uh, it's very open. It, it is in all major uh, multi, uh, multinational, uh, multilateral trade agreements. It has very high level of bilateral trade agreements. It trades with everyone. It is increasingly upping its position in global supply chain. So in, in many ways, and it is also expanding, you know, in terms of uh, defense and strategic network, not only dip, uh, diploma, uh, diplomatic networks. So in that way, it has advanced. It capacity much more than if you compare to the Cold War. Uh, the, the disparity will be there as, as, as a nature of look at just as, at, this, uh, at the size, but the more China goes inward, um, as we witness now uh, during the COVID um, and, you know, that great power competition, decoupling, you name it, uh, the more Vietnam actually is uh, has an advantageous position of being the, the more connected and international one. So definitely there is a change. 
Thank you. Richard? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, as always, Hunter, perfect attendance. <laughs> I mean, he, he's there in all, uh, all the events and uh, raising the quick, uh, good, good. I mean, actually, what I'm going to tell to Hunter is similar to what I wanted to also say to Don, because for me, there is pragmatism and there is pragmatism. And if I like the term ethical realism, right? Because there's a Chinese version of pragmatism which says, hey, go with the highest bidder and then we can cut the deal from there. But there's a pragmatism that looks at principles as long-term norms and rules that avoid the rule of the jungle situation, right? So actually being principled is actually being pragmatic too, except more long-term. So your time horizons are just different, right? Because the whole rules-based order is about, you know, it's about a vision of the future or preserving a certain vision of what has been there for quite some time, right? So, so for me, there's a temporality aspect there, which is ontologically lost in a lot of our conversation. Now, going back to the Philippines, I would say the same. Uh, there is independent foreign policy and there is independent foreign policy. In fact, it's in our constitution to have an independent foreign policy, right? That was, that was one reason why we got rid of the American permanent basis in the Philippines, right? But the reality is how do you operationalize that will depend on actual you know, uh, balance of forces on the ground, not to mention the strategic orientation and priorities of each administration. You know, we had people like President Estrada, right, who essentially slept through one of his national security advisor briefings on the mischief reef. And then you have someone like Duterte, whose idea of independent foreign policy is bashing uh, traditional allies and praising China. But I think we're closer to understanding. Uh, I think the Philippines has been closest, and I'll be very controversial here. Uh, I don't mind because I think this is much closer to reality. I think the Marcoses, both the father and the son, have been much closer to approximating what an independent foreign policy is. This is not an endorsement of their domestic policies or their human rights record whatsoever. No, no question about it. But the father, back in the 60s and 70s, if you look at the speeches, he was already talking about the Philippines as one of the pillars of the global non-aligned movement, as this afro ashatic post-colonial world solidarity. That is why, and look at what he did. He kept our alliance with the, with the Americans while reaching out to Eastern Bloc countries, to Romania, uh, to Czechoslovakia, to Soviet Union, while also being among first US allies to normalize ties with Mao Zedong, and at the same time being one of the co-founders of ASEAN, playing an important role. And not to mention, you know, one day you have Imelda Marcos taking picture with the Reagans, and next day she's with Fidel Castro. And then, the next, I mean, that's the closest you can get, right? To kind of a polyamorous, pluralistic, multi-vector, multi-hedging foreign policy, right? Uh, maybe I have to correct the polyamorous part. It might be misinterpreted. I didn't mean it in that way. I meant it in a purely diplomatic sense. Okay. Uh, sorry, I had two hours of sleep, so... So going back to it, I think the son is kind of following in the footsteps of the father, right? I mean, we have jokingly called Duterte the father of the nation, right? And I always said, he's not like father Duterte, but more like father Marcos, right? And, and if you look at Marcos Jr., he's doing the same, right? He's aspiring to be one of the leaders of ASEAN. His first visits were to Indonesia and Singapore. He talked about ASEAN centrality, et cetera. I don't know how familiar he is with the, with the whole literature, et cetera, um, or the history, but he, there is that aspiration. He's very multi-vector. He's very friendly with Britain, right, where he, he supposedly graduated. His children graduated, right? He's also very close to Japan. I think he'll visit Japan very close to his visit to China, right? So, so I think that is the closest we can get to an independent foreign policy as far as signaling is concerned. But for me, the problem is, and that's my piece on Nikkei Asia yesterday, is like, how sustainable is that? When at the same time, you're going to increase bilateral exercises with the U.S. by 60%, right, from 300 to 500 uh, exercises and activities. You're going to have 16,000 American troops and Filipino troops exercising for war games, which clearly have a South China Sea aspect. And you may open up up to 10 bases to Americans, including bases close to Taiwan. So that's my point. Like, um, we cannot have the cake in 82. I mean, I think Hong pointed out, like, you know, I mean, Jacoby does this deal with Russia and then says this. Yeah, I mean, my point is that you can get away with that. At some point, you have to make a choice, right? Tough choices, hard choices, to use the Clinton, Hillary Clinton term. Hard choices await us in ASEAN. And at some point, if you want to just play it opportunistic, if you want to play it short term, it's going to catch up with us. Because at the end of the day, ASEAN, the best weapon we have is essentially our appeal to international law, right? Our appeal to long-term vision of a rule-based order in the region. And if we 
keep on doing opportunistic shenanigans on the sidelines, right? And don't do our proper balancing. That's going to catch up with us at some point in time. We are going to lose any kind of moral ascendancy and capital. And why does moral ascendancy matter? I'm not a naive person when it comes to, to international relations, but let's be honest. If you want to have authority in international affairs, right? This is base, basic political science. You need to have respect and trust, right? And that's why moral authority matters because it has something to do with respect and trust. And that's why ASEAN has to have some principled approach to foreign policy, because once we lose the respect and trust, it will be much harder for us to rally support uh, when the ugly time comes. And we see in the case of Ukraine, moral considerations are as important as geopolitical consideration as far as the Western help to Ukraine is concerned. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it there. I think I'm getting off the track. But let me get, say again, the polyamorous statement was purely a strategic diplomatic term. I meant nothing by that. Okay, I don't do those stuff. Okay. Perhaps before uh, giving you the next question from the audience, maybe <clears throat> I could follow up on what you've just said uh, with the following uh, question. With regard to pragmatism, um, obviously pragmatism is a variable. Uh, individual countries, leaders can be more or less pragmatic uh, depending upon the situation and various domestic considerations and so forth. Um, but if we agree, which we may not, but at least let's, uh, for purposes of discussion, consider the possibility that a major development in years to come will be the growing role and influence of India. Um, it's interesting, I think, to note uh, that not only is India the eye uh, in BRICS, uh, but of course it's, it's part of the Quad. Uh, so in a way, it has a foot in both I want to say camps, I guess, although that's perhaps an exaggeration. And so what do you, I wonder if either one of you, but particularly perhaps uh, Richard, since you've talked about uh, uh, the, the, the importance of principles, uh, looking forward, if India does play uh, an increasingly important role in the, in the topic that we're discussing, uh, how pragmatic do you think they will be? Or conversely, how much will they be devoted to a principle associated with their own history and the development of the non-aligned movement, a principle that basically says what's happening to Ukraine is absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable on principled grounds. What do you think? I think I want Hong to go because she's in Vietnam. <laughs> Sorry, I want to put the other. No, I want to see the Hong's point of view and I'll, I'll, I'll comment, yeah. I'll be very quick on India. I think, uh, first of all, Richard quote the survey from um, Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute, where, and, and he ended on a very useful note of trust, which is in a, um, very critical for uh, any alignment movement. And in that survey, um, I think Southeast Asian countries trust the least, not China, but India. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration while all the countries in the region um, I think value and see great importance of India, not least Vietnam, who you know has a long-standing relationship with. I think the um, the attitude towards India and to its growing role um, and pragmatism behind that is very very different from how the U.S. or Australia and other countries that do promote that Indo-Pacific see India. The huge hype about India that is very um, you know, tangible in the US and Australia is not necessarily shared in Southeast Asia, uh, notwithstanding the understanding of, of India's importance. But I think, um, uh, I, I think the Southeast Asian have very, very tempered expectations. They know India will go its own way at its own path. Uh, there isn't that much of expectation that India as of now will um, be a, a stronger balancer or pick up more of the security role despite that uh, you know presence in the quad and stuff um, but uh, the only you know um, the not only but I think the important um, a lot um, you know like-minded point to use this this term where, between Southeast Asia and India is that development agenda um, and you would see from India's Indo-Pacific um, articulation, because they haven't had really a policy document, 
um, that development uh, agenda is, is there, similar to ASEAN's um, outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Inclusivity is there, at least it was um, uh, some time ago when Modi was giving speech um, at the Shangri-La dialogue um, on the Indo-Pacific. That means that region cannot exclude China. This is, you know, he hasn't really made the reference uh, to that back since then. But, uh, you know, the, the, that understanding of the region uh, is shared. Um, I'll just end up on the note that uh, Don, you mentioned uh, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Um, they still see Indo-Pacific as a two, two regions, right? Um, the Indian Ocean region and the, the Pacific region. We'll see an update hopefully uh, next year under Indonesia's chairmanship because it is when it is expected that um, there would be some update and, and some sort of, um, uh, I don't know, blueprint or, or any kind of um, more pragmatic uh, uh, approach to that in the Pacific. But certainly I think there, uh, while they are they're understanding the growth of China, their expectations are very uh, tempered. Yes, thank you. Richard? Richard? I believe it. Believe it or not, Don, I think Hong covered as okay. much as possible. I'll wait for the next questions, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, it, it does raise a larger question, which was actually one of the questions that was asked uh, uh, in the audience, uh, which I'm rephrasing here. And that is, what are the chances that the notion of the Indo-Pacific, not just the uh, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, if I can amend the question a little bit, but the very concept of the Indo-Pacific will acquire an instrumental kind of influence or impact so that people will not think of it as an abstraction that covers so much space and is right. so internally diverse that it really has no utility in policy terms to actually right. develop it to the point where it begins to have utility in policy terms. And then despite uh, uh, Hung's comments about the limitations uh, that, that may be associated with eventual Indian leadership, because right. the I in Indo, in the Indo-Pacific, obviously brings us right smack down to New Delhi, right, to India. Yes. Uh, does that presuppose that Indian foreign policy will be a lot more successful than perhaps uh, Hung is suggesting, and I would agree with her, uh, at least in the short run, it would turn out to be? I yeah. could, yeah, sorry, yeah. Just very yeah. quickly before I give Go it back ahead. to the microphone to you, just supplement the the question with the um, the one that Don just um, asked. I think um, with Indo Pacific, that very concept. Uh, what are the main, some of the main criticism or shortcomings of this Indo-Pacific? Uh, for the US is lack of the economic pillar, right? Real pragmatic, tangible one. Um, and if you look at indo part, the biggest economy is obviously India and the Pacific US. And neither India nor US are part of the major trade deals that are happening in the region. So you don't have the economic support of the Indo-Pacific. If you look at India as a core, you know, to expand that Indo-Pacific and US as a, one of the you know, key leaders of the concept, right, or, or promoters. Um, so obviously from the region that is interested in economic development and trade and, and, uh, um, and resilience, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. this is a, a pillar you cannot miss. And yet the two major, you know, anchors of Indo-Pacific are missing in the picture. And another, another point I just wanted to supplement uh, on India is that despite being the quad in different uh, minilaterals and plurilaterals, India is yet to be uh, um, uh, a giver or a supplier of uh, public goods, right? We have, uh, mm -hmm. India is not the one that supplies mm -hmm. development and uh, public goods to Southeast Asia. And that's a, a big missing point right and i don't see it coming very soon we have trilateral of um japan australia uh, us on the infrastructure and vaccines and all of that but still it, india is missing and that might be contributing to the the regional views of india richard back to you yeah uh, on, on the india question i mean uh, we also see for instance service in the philippines of not thought leaders like the ics but ordinary people also suggesting india is very low rated 
And I think that's also a reflection of the fact that India is broadly seen as still a heavily developing country with a lot of domestic problems. So I think there's a lot of stereotypes also, unfortunately, there. But clearly, going back to the point I and Hong also raised, I mean, look at it. India talks about free and open in the Pacific, and yet look at how much interest it has shown in RCEP, how much interest it has shown in globalization since the deadlock in the Doha negotiations. I mean, I don't want to be the one to blame India all the time, but I noticed whenever I raised it, our Indian friends were extremely defensive about it. But I mean, part of the deal is to welcome free uh, free trade, or at least be open to more economic integration. And we see that India is much more comfortable with bilateral this, with Australia, et cetera. And that sounds very China, right? Uh, while we want a much more multilateral one, I think many Muslim countries or Muslim individuals in Southeast Asia are uncomfortable with what they're seeing in Kashmir, right? Or the treatment of the Muslim minority in India, no? And of course, as someone has been covering authoritarian populists like Duterte, I said, well, don't only look at the Philippines, also look at India. There's interesting things going on there, right? So that's, that's my point. Like, I think there's a perception among Indian strategic elite that they can present themselves as the benign alternative to China. But the reality is that there are some at the very least, perception issues that they have to overcome, and then perhaps some also substantive issues and clarification. But of course, I'm always open to more engagement with India. And by the way, their BrahMos uh, cruise missile deal, supersonic missile deal with the Philippines, could be just the opening salvo in India becoming a major trade, I'm sorry, military trade partner, military uh, source of hardware in Southeast Asia, especially as Russia has a hard time because India can also produce very similar weaponry, some de derivative at very cheap cost. So that's the other part where things are moving fast with India while they're also ambivalence. But going back to AOIP, because Fred uh, from RSIS has, has, has raised this point, very good point on the AOIP. Let's be honest, I think there's a Martin Interagawa, Marsudi angle to the AOIP, right? And I think Marsudi of Indonesia was very proactive in pushing that for AOIP uh, adoption when Thailand, I think, was in charge of ASEAN, right? A few years ago. If I'm not saying that's, that's, that's some sort of story. So I won't be surprised if Indonesia keep on raising the AOIP uh, next year in ways that has not been raised perhaps under Cambodia or previously. But what I want to also emphasize there is that, uh, and this goes back to the discussion I had with Gordon Flake in Jakarta recently, like he raised a very good point. Like, okay, you have an outlook on Indo-Pacific, but you haven't still, I mean, to paraphrase, but we haven't figured out what to do with East Timor, which is kind of Pacific, South Pacific, right? Like we don't even have a decent policy on our own Pacific backyard, which is kind of East Timor, right? I mean, do you get what I'm saying? Like, I am, I am not, I mean, Gibbon said something fantastic in, in the decline and fall of Roman Empire. He said, you know, like essentially to paraphrase, uh, uh, valor without virtue is recipe for disaster, right? And, and I see a lot of valor in AOIP, but I want to see more virtue, including, right? If we're going to do virtue signaling, right, used to, to use the woke term, Back it up, including in your own backyard with East Timor, right? So I, I think that's the problem with ASEAN. We sometimes overshoot, become defensive, and then follow through becomes a problem. So I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic that under Indonesia, we might see some house cleaning. But then again, I don't know what's going to happen after Indonesia. That's why th this, so clearly, I, I think, Don, we're seeing that there's like a desperation mode also in ASEAN. I, that, that's my wor worry, that there's a there's sense of desperation. And as I said, first of all, and I'll, that actually will be my last point in this intervention. Let's not forget ASEAN as an organization, right? I mean, our good friend Bilahari always says like EU, EU is Soviet Union without human rights. I always say ASEAN is small and medium enterprise without human rights, right? It's a very limited organization in terms of its capacity. And I was shameless enough to say it next to an ASEAN sec Deputy Secretary General. So I think we have to temper our expectation of ASEAN, but key ASEAN countries, I know that sounds controversial, have to step up. And through minilateral cooperation, we might have a better way of operationalizing AUIP, including figuring out with our Singaporean friends, what are we going to do with East Timor? Because I'm, I know that our Singaporean friends are not very excited about East Timor joining in. But we cannot talk about Indo-Pacific and ASEAN centrality if we cannot even figure out what's happening with East Timor. Very well taken. William Tuchrello asks a question that I would like to generalize into <clears throat> the question, what effect will domestic developments inside the respective Southeast Asian countries have over the coming years? What effect will those domestic developments have on the issues uh, that we've been discussing? Uh, William, uh, in particular, mentions the Indonesian elections, uh, forthcoming, uh, as we know, and also the recent Malaysian elections. But 
uh, one might generalize beyond just the issue of elections. Are there certain possible events uh, that are kind of waiting to happen inside Southeast Asian countries that will affect our conversation? Either one of you. Yeah, Hong, you want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, um, the domestic politics will be critical. And I think Richard uh, already described how um, to the extent in the Philippines things are changing. Uh, and it can be, you know, quite drastic uh, in those countries and Indonesia, Malaysia, the, the countries that have democratic uh, elections. Uh, we can see the changes overnight uh, through the, the um, elections and change of leadership, but also the nature of the stability uh, of the uh, of the power there, right? The more um, unstable uh, countries, the, the more they tend to be inward looking and frankly less interested or less capable to deal with external strategic issues. And uh, relatively speaking, we can say that uh, of Thailand uh, in the recent decade already, um, uh, uh, so certainly uh, it is a huge factor. Um, otherwise, you know, Thailand will be an, a very important voice within the region, but it is a lot of times missing in the picture. Um, similarly, I don't expect much of um, Myanmar being able to, to act um, in a, a cohesive strategic way. And really it's a, it's a big question mark for the whole region, ASEAN itself. Uh, we, we've been talking about, you know, ASEAN, um, being able to act on itself first and foremost well look look at the crisis within right and i think it is only going to uh, likely to be um, de deteriorated and potentially taking advantage of um so it, it's a big hot spot there even with if you if you look at more stable countries uh, in terms of, of leadership like singapore and vietnam well singapore will also face a, a leadership change uh, soon and uh, what we know of you know singapore's very influential especially when it comes to strategic issues voice with, like represents the intellectual and a very much conceptual voice of southeast asia most of the time you hear uh, Prime Minister Lee or, or his cabinet being quoted on these issues of strategic choice and whatnot, a very, very, uh, you know, astute and known to establishment in, in the US and other countries, knowing the region for uh, carrying on this knowledge for a long time. This can change as well with the, with the new uh, generations of leadership at post Lee um, uh, era. Uh, with Vietnam, well, right now it's a leadership in a very, um, you know, some of them has crossed the age uh, limitations. Uh, their succession plan is not yet very well understood. Um, so that, uh, well, we expect continuity in the foreign policy, you know, th there's nothing we can take for granted. So the region is in flux, it is going to change. And uh, depending on who is in power, the leadership uh, will, will also affect the region's um, strategic options that they take. And, and again, I would emphasize the point that I made in the opening remarks, which is a very fragmented uh, picture and it's going to be uh, no less any, uh, no, no any less fragmented going ahead, I think. Yeah, Don, I see there are more questions. So I'll be very quick about this. Uh, obviously from conceptual standpoint, if this were a journal article, uh, you, you can put it in a quadrant, right? You know, low levels of state building, high levels, high, lower levels of institutionalization of foreign policy, right? And then right. so on and so forth, right? So I kind of agree with, I definitely agree with Hong with that. I, I must also add that um, despite some changes in the domestic landscape, we're also seeing some interesting continuities, right? So I think for Indonesia, even with shifts in the government, all the sense that they're, they have arrived, they're part of the G20. They're an emerging middle class. I, I felt that sense is very strong. And I think whether it's a Prabowo guy, it's, it's Jokowi's white-haired governor friend guy, whoever it is, I think it will be part of the DNA of the Indonesia's 21st century identity that, hey, our time has arrived, we have to be taken seriously, right? So I think the continuity will be there, even though they have a messy democracy like the Philippines. And in the case of the Philippines, I mean, Hong pointed out very well the Singapore and the Vietnam cases. We generally know that semi-authoritarian countries have better long-term whatever but going back to the philippines um the genie is also out of the uh, out of the bottle in a sense that we do not treat our relationship with us 
with the same reverence as before. I think Duterte has completely changed the game forever. So much so that I see even opposition, uh, I, uh, people you know, who are against Duterte are saying, hey, actually the guy makes sense. Where were the Americans for us when the mischief reef happened? Where were the Americans for us when the Scarborough shall happen? And I want to say, like, I've been saying that for quite some time. And then now but when they saw Duterte getting away with it, suddenly they're saying, you know what, maybe we can do that too. So my sense is this idea that uh, we have to be less dependent in America. We have to be more transactional in the sense of getting the more out of our alliance with America. I think that's going to stay with us no matter who's going to be the next Filipino president, even after Marcos Jr. So I'm seeing some continuities, right? Despite, I mean, even in the messier democracies, um, essentially we have two or three democracies only, right? In Southeast Asia. So I think that's also an interesting thing to keep in mind. I, I don't think that's going to go away. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. There is a question about Japan. Uh, the question asks, uh, can, can you explain why Japan is so popular in Southeast Asia despite the history, uh, the greater East Asian co-prosperity yeah. sphere. Uh, we remember that, uh, at least historically. Any, either one of you want to answer that question? Why is Japan so popular? OK, maybe I'll go first. I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, things were horrible to in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, my grandmother actually is Chinese background, right? So her parents were almost buried alive by the Japanese, right? And, and she only saved her family because she could sing the Japanese national anthem back then, which she can still do at 86 years old with all of that kind of creepy, right? So we had horrible times under the Japanese occupation in Southeast Asia. So it's not only the Chinese, they had horrible things, the Nanking massacre. It's not only the South Koreans, but interestingly, the Taiwanese were occupied too, but the perceptions of Japan are very important. So in short, actual historical aggression doesn't correlate very strongly with concurrent attitudes towards Japan. There are many, many variables. Just to be very quick about Southeast Asia, we see with the exception of Singapore, which is Chinese majority, right? Um, the attitudes towards Japan are very positive, right? Uh, among average people, if you look at the different barometers and surveys. Uh, so definitely there's a cultural, historicized, uh, political, politicization of history aspect to it and historiographical aspect to it. But the thing with Japan is that they took an actively developmental aspect to Southeast Asia from the 1960s onwards. Uh, mm -hmm. their, their establishment of the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines and the visit by then Emperor of Japan to the Philippines was very much part of the charm offensive. And that's why now we, we see Japan more as Hello Kitty ra rather than you know, the kamikazes, right? Because of that very active developmental approach, not to mention the Japanese soft power, right? I think that's, that's a big factor. So I'm not gonna say it's, it's historical amnesia, right? That our Chinese friends supposedly have better historical memory than Southeast Asia. I don't think it's that. And let's be very clear. Japan doesn't do the big talk like the Americans, doesn't do the big talk like the Chinese, but they deliver. So if you look at not only stock infrastructure investment, but new infrastructure investment, I keep on saying it, the Chinese keep on getting a lot of bang for imaginary buck. Where are the investments in the Philippines? Show me. But I can show you the Japanese investments, including a metro underground multi-billion dollar project here in the Philippines, plus so many more. And we saw in the Fitch uh, um, numbers in 2019, Japan actually trounces China. Japan alone, just Japan, trounces China by tens of billions of dollars in terms of new infrastructure uh, commitments. I'm sure Hong can say, can say a lot because in Vietnam, similar to the Philippines, Japan is also a very top investor, big investor. So with the exception, I think, of Cambodia and, and, and I, some of the Indochina countries, actually Japan is very competitive with China and in Vietnam and the Philippines, I think it's even a bigger investor, actual investors, not pledging investor when it comes to new projects. So we're not blind, we see that and we appreciate that. And the Japanese, are both Western and not, right? They're Western in the sense that they have some semblance of rule of law and democracy, but they're also Asians like us, so they can speak our language and not be lecturish when they deal with that. That's why Duterte loved Japan, perhaps more than any other country, right? Because they know how to deal with, especially more, um, you know, spicy <laughs> counterparts in Asia. So the Japanese are so good on so many fronts, and that's why it helped them a lot to have the kind of soft power they have today. And I, I hope they continue. I call them a stealth superpower as far as Southeast Asia is concerned because of those many reasons I mentioned. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I think mm -hmm. it's about consistency. Yes, there's a level of that amnesia there, but Japan has uh, post-war has been 
um, uh, through and through in the region, presence with development um, uh, ODA, but also investment, it is not coming in and out. It is consistent. It is a part of the region. Um, it, but uh, importantly, on top of what Richard already mentioned, yes, it is the top investor in terms of uh, in, uh, infrastructure and not, is also the factor that it is uh, seen as benign, right? It is not uh, threatening, it, not, it is not demanding from Southeast Asia to choose or to demanding any other actions. Um, it, does, it does not demand having a, a presence of troops or base. It is not, you know, incurring into their borders. So it's not a threatening actor, it is a giving actor. Um, and importantly, I think for, uh, you know, uh, I won't repeat what Richard already elaborated, but for, for countries like Vietnam to have that uh, model, right, of a country also very affected by war and now being, you know, really a top-notch uh, economy uh, with the quality that everybody admires, I think that's a huge appeal. Um, and that, that ability to, to speak um, very bluntly in some ways, but also in a way that doesn't offend anyone. I mean, it was right. Pri Prime Minister Kishida that said in Shangri-La that, you know, Ukraine today can be East Asia tomorrow, but nobody really jumped on that because that's the, the ability to feel exactly, uh, uh, you know, the, the line where it, it doesn't cross in terms of messaging and political messaging uh, in the region is very, very astute. And I would just say that uh, Japan represents that, not maybe, not necessary middle, but uh, other options in the G2, right? And more so than other countries, more so than Australia, which is seen much, much more aligned um, and having the same, uh, saying the same things as, as US or even more so than, than uh, uh, South Korea. So it is welcome as an, uh, an ideal um, uh, alternative uh, between the US and, and China. So I'm now going to go out on a limb and uh, part, with partly with my sense of humor in mind, but not entirely. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we have answered the question uh, that has hovered over the three of us and also the audience, uh, namely, you know, what to do, uh, whom to choose, right? And the answer is choose Japan. And uh, to take me seriously for a moment, uh, precisely building upon the non-military one might even say non-political appreciation of Japan at the level of economic interaction in particular, but also, you know, a colleague of mine uh, recently uh, did a book called, you know, The Courteous Power, right? <laughs> Japan has this reputation. Now, they weren't very courteous during the Bataan Death March. Let's remember that. We have to keep history in mind. But nevertheless, the argument here is that we have just answered our question, that the greatest prospect for choice is not choosing the U.S., not certainly not choosing Russia, not choosing China, choosing Japan. And, and, and I mention that in the context of the movement of Japan increasingly into the security sector, right. uh, which we already see. Uh, you know, Article 9 uh, still exists, but its interpretation has stretched it substantially. And so now we're talking about uh, weapons, actually, and in terms of production and so forth. I mean, you know the details, I'm sure, better than I do. And therefore, one might argue that it's the right time for Southeast Asia to develop an intimate relationship with Japan, knowing that on, based on that trust, when Japan does move more into the security sector, it will not in any way endanger Southeast Asia. Right. What do you think of that? I think just to um, follow the, the threat, um, I think in terms of economics and development, there isn't much to dispute there. Mind you that also it was Japan that carry on the CPTPP after US withdrawal and save it from 
uh, collapse. So certainly in that uh, aspect. In security, I think it's worth another seminar if you if you um, entertain the idea for perhaps a next quarter. Uh, I think there are limitations to that. Of course, Japan has been, especially with this um, maritime countries supplying the Coast Guard and trainings and, and certainly um, you know, some of them would, would want to see that development uh, of more defense um, ambitious Japan. But I think there are um, ten real um, limitations there. I think perhaps that conclusion would need some major caveats uh, that the next seminar would need to uh, address too. Yeah. Richard, you want to comment? And, and if, if not, I think it's time to wrap up pretty soon. So in a minute or two so but richard if you'd like to comment feel free i think i, I just lost my train of thought <laughs> no, it's okay let's just close it because it, it's gonna i'm just gonna say more and more and more thank you very much uh uh hong and uh, thank you very much also don for for fantastic conversation. well thank you to the two of you i it's been a very stimulating conversation i've learned a lot i think those who have attended also have learned a lot uh, and i really appreciate it very much thank you thank you thank you and i wish you both the very best going forward. Okay, take Thank care. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, all the best. Take care.